I will say that I still believe that my son, Lee Harvey Oswald, is innocent. And I intend to continue in the investigation uh, with his attorney, Mr. Mark Lane. I have tried to get Mr. Mark Lane to represent my son as an attorney before the Warren Commission. If he had lived, of course, he would be entitled to counsel. I think he is entitled to counsel now, and I think all of America now is entitled to have counsel for Lee Oswald so that we can find out actually what took place on November 22nd. One week after the assassination, President Kennedy's successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, appointed a President's Commission with Chief Justice Earl Warren as chairman. The record which follows is an attack on the methods and conclusions of that commission. It is a plea for the defense, and as such, it is not objective. This commission has functioned in a fashion which totally disregards the rights of the accused. A person charged with a crime in this country is entitled to a number of rights, among them the right to present evidence, the right to have a counsel, cross-examine evidence adduced against him, the right to a public trial. Every one of these traditional American rights has been denied to Lee Harvey Oswald. Are you charging the Chief Justice with a cover-up? The Chief Justice himself told the press of the world that the facts may never be released by the Chief Justice in this case because of questions of national security. Yes, I'm of course charging the government with not only suppressing information, I'm charging the FBI and the Secret Service with operating this case from a theory that Oswald was the assassin, that he acted alone, and, for, and I'm charging them with pursuing investigation only along those lines and having no interest in any information which indicates anything contrary to their preconceived theory. Sergeant Nelson Delgado served in the Marine Corps with Lee Harvey Oswald. Mark Lane questions him. Sergeant, prior to your Warren Commission testimony. Were you interviewed by agents of the FBI? Yes, they came to my home in South Jersey to interview me. The first two visits, <clears throat> they came just to get my story, what I knew about Oswald, how close we were, and things like that. After that, then they started, the questions were tending to break my story down. Sergeant, where are you now stationed? Down in one of the missile sites in uh, South Jersey have been there since prior to the assassination of Kennedy. Uh, I've been here now for three years, and this month, the 20th to be exact, I'm leaving for uh, Vietnam. Was Oswald interested in guns? They say he was a gun enthusiast, but uh, I recall many instances where we stood inspections and he was constantly being gigged uh, for having a dirty weapon and then taking improper care of his weapon. Do you have personal knowledge of Oswald's ability with a rifle. He, um, it's been said that he's been a terrific uh, marksman. At the range, he didn't, he, he couldn't prove by me that he was a good shot. As any person who's ever served in the armed forces could tell you, there's a part in the qualification that calls for rapid firing. This is done with 10 shots, eight in a clip and two that you load by hand. They give you maybe 30 or 45 seconds to be exact to fire these 10 rounds. Well, when you fire these, then you stand away from your, from your firing position until everyone has finished firing. Then the targets are brought down and scored. The targets are run back up and they're dissed for the number that you have hit. Fives, fours, threes, or misses. Well, in Oswald's particular case, it was quite funny to, to look at because he would get a couple of discs Maybe out of the possible 10, he'll get two or three Maggie's drawers. Now, these are a red flag that's on a long pole, and this is run from left to right on the target itself. And you don't see this on a firing line too often, not in the Marine firing line. And we thought it was funny that Oswald was getting these Maggie's drawers so rapidly, one after the other. And this is why I can't say, uh, think that he could be a, a good shot, because a good shot doesn't pull this. He'll pull a three, but he won't pull a Maggie's drawer. It's a complete miss. How did the FBI react to your statement that Oswald was a poor shot? They tried to disprove this. They 
did not like the idea when I came up with the the statement that Oswald, as far as I knew, Oswald was was a very poor shot. Who didn't like the idea? The FBI people that investigate that they were interviewing me, and they brought two men down, two uh, strangers, uh, to disprove this part of the, my testimony. Do you feel that the agents of the FBI actually tried to get you to change your statement that Oswald was a poor shot? Yes, sir, I definitely do. Nine wounds, four to President Kennedy, five to Governor Connolly, presented the commission with another puzzle. Did two bullets do all of the damage? A frame-by-frame -frame study of film taken at the time proved that two of the shots occurred within 1.8 seconds, an impossibility. The commission agreed that the rifle could not be operated that quickly. Commission counsel Rankin stated, to say they were hit by separate bullets is synonymous with saying that there were two assassins. But two assassins did not fit, so a new assumption was made. One bullet struck both the president and the governor, a one-bullet, two-victim theory. Necessity dictated that the theory become a conclusion. However, Governor Connolly, in a press conference... I am convinced beyond any question of a doubt that the first shot that was fired did not hit me. Then I was hit. And I was not then, and I'm not... I have no memory, no recollection of the sound of the shot that hit me. And beyond any question of a doubt, the third shot did not hit me. Uh, Ms. Connolly has the very definite feeling, a very strong conviction that the first shot that was fired hit the president. The second shot that was fired hit me. The third shot that was fired hit the president. But unquestionably, when the first shot was fired, I recognized it as a shot. I thought of nothing else but that it was a rifle shot. Uh, I turned to my right. I had time to think. I had time to react. And I turned to my right to look back over my right shoulder to see if I could see anything unusual and particularly to see if I could catch him out of the corner of my eye. Because I immediately him, thought... Him, you mean the... The president. The president. Because I immediately thought of an assassination attempt. The moment I heard the shot, I didn't see anything except just the general blur of waving of, of people moving. And, but nothing really unusual. Uh, I did not see the president out of the corner of my eye, and I was in the process of turning back to look over my left shoulder. Mrs. Connolly, who was seated alongside her husband, also took issue with the one-bullet, two-victim theory. She testified. It was just a frightening noise, and it came from the right. I turned over my right shoulder and looked back and saw the president as he had both hands at his neck. And it seemed to me there was, he made no utterance, no cry. I saw no blood, no anything. It was just sort of nothing, the expression on his face, and he just sort of slumped down. Then very soon, there was the second shot that hit John. As the first shot was hit and I turned to look at the same time, I recall John saying, oh no, no, no. Then there was a second shot, and it hit John. And as he recoiled to the right, just crumpled like a wounded animal to the right, he said, my God. They're going to kill us all. The commission countered with the news that Governor Connolly was merely struck a glancing blow to a rib, thereby explaining his delayed reaction. But on November 22nd, Dr. Robert R. Shaw, who treated Governor Connolly at Parkland Memorial Hospital, described the wound. He seemed to have been struck by just one bullet which entered the right posterior chest close to the shoulder blade and coursed downward along the chest wall, taking out and fragmenting a portion of the fifth rib on the right. The bullet then emerged from the chest, evidently struck his right wrist, fracturing the 
lower portion of the right radius and then entered the left thigh where it was spent. Our major problem was the sucking wound of the right chest wall because in making the wound of the chest, the fragments of the fifth rib became what we refer to as secondary missiles and these caused a considerable amount of tissue damage in the point where the missile emerged from the chest. The hard evidence which conclusively demolishes the commission's case is that more grains of metal were found in one of the governor's wounds than were missing from this bullet. The commission's autopsy expert, Commander Humes, testified, I do not understand how it could possibly have left fragments in the wrist. As to the fragments in the governor's thigh wound, Commander Humes added, I cannot conceive of where they came from this missile. S.M. Holland, a supervisor for the Union Terminal Railroad, was on the triple overpass directly above and in front of the presidential car. Mark Lane begins. The commission also stated, as you know, Mr. Holland, that the same bullet which hit Governor Connolly first struck President Kennedy. Based upon what you observed from that position just above the street on the overpass, is that possible? No. No, that Warren Commission is in error on that because I was an eyewitness to that, and I know that the same bullet that hit President Kennedy did not hit Governor Connolly. The first bullet, the president slumped over, and Governor Connolly made his turn to the right and then back to the left, and that's when the second shot was fired and knocked him down in the floorboard. And it would have been impossible for him to turn had the bullet hit, the same bullet hit him that went through the president's neck. And did you see the, see the effect of the next bullet which struck President Kennedy? I saw the effects of the next bullet that struck the president because it flipped him over almost on his stomach and the side of his head, and his head was laying on the edge of the seat. He was laying more on his stomach, and his foot was hanging out of the, over the car, edge of the car, upside down. The Warren Commission's case depended completely on all of the shots being fired from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. Page 71 of the Warren Report. The Commission's investigation has disclosed no credible evidence that any shots were fired from anywhere else. And yet Lee Bowers, Jr., who was in a railroad tower overlooking the assassination, reported... I was at the um, south end of the uh, terminal, of uh, the tower building, uh, rather, looking down toward the terminal and observing the motorcade, as was everyone else in the area. Could you tell us what you heard and what you saw from about 12 noon until the time that the shots were fired? Well, for some time that morning, since uh, perhaps 10 o'clock in the morning, we had had the area pretty well sealed off. And uh, the policemen had been uh, stationed on the triple underpass as well as other strategic corners in the area. Uh, however, about uh, 12, 10, give or take five minutes, there was a car which entered the area and probed around for some time. Uh, this car was a 59 Oldsmobile station wagon with a out-of-state uh, license. It uh, was muddy as if it had just come in off of the road from some area where it was a red, sandy area. Uh, it uh, was occupied by one male who spent uh, three or four minutes in the area uh, looking it over and then not uh, too long after that, perhaps uh, five or six minutes, 
a car of a totally different description also occupied by one male entered the area. Now this man uh, performed a similar action and he toured down around the area probing to examine the exits and uh, seemed at uh, one or more occasions to have a mic or something resembling uh, such an instrument up to his face. Just a few moments after that, um, the third car uh, came into the area. Uh, I could not state that these cars left the area entirely because after they got back onto the extension of Elm Street in front of the school depository building, they were lost to my vision so that uh, they could have remained uh, very close by. Mr. Bowers, did you see any pedestrians at any time between your tower and Elm Street? There were, uh, at the time of the shooting, in my vision, only two men. Uh, these two men were uh, standing back from the street somewhat at the top of the incline and were very near uh, two trees which are in the area. And one of them from time to time as he walked back and forth uh, disappeared behind a wooden fence which also is uh, slightly to the west of that. Uh, these uh, two men, to the best of my knowledge, were standing there uh, at the time uh, of the shooting. Uh, at the time of the shooting, uh, in the vicinity of where the two men I've described were, there was a flash of light, or an, there was something which occurred which caught my eye in this immediate area on the embankment. Mr. Barrows, how many shots did you hear? There were three shots, and these were spaced uh, with one shot, then a pause, and then two shots in very close order, such as perhaps uh, almost on top of each other while there was some pause between the first and the second shots. Did you tell that to the Dallas police? Uh, yes, I, I told this to the police, and then uh, also told it to the uh, FBI, and also I had a discussion uh, two or three days later with him concerning this, and uh, they uh, made no comment, um, other than the fact that uh, when I stated I felt like the second and third shots could not have been fired from the same rifle, uh, they um, reminded me that I wasn't an expert, and uh, I had to agree. Lee Bowers, Jr., whose voice you have just heard, is now dead killed in a crash outside Dallas three months after we interviewed him. Mark Lane resumes his questioning of S.M. Holland. Did you look in any particular direction when you heard the shots? Yes. I looked over to where I thought the shot came from. And I saw a puff of smoke still lingering underneath the trees in front of the wooden fence. The report sounded like it came from behind the wooden fence. You were a witness who had as good a view of that scene as anyone in Dealey Plaza. Where do you think the shots came from? Well, I know where that third shot came from. Where did that shot come from? Behind the picket fence. Is there any? Close to the little plaza. Is there any doubt in your mind that that shot came from behind the There's fence? no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind in the statement that I made to, in the sheriff's office immediately after the shooting and the statement that I made to the Warren Commission that I made it very plain there was no doubt in my mind but what there was definitely a shot fired from behind that picket fence. I made it plain to the Warren Commission, and I think I made the same statement in the sheriff's office. There was a fourth shot. Witnesses who contradicted the commission ringed the entire Dealey Plaza area. Here is R.C. Dodd, who was on the triple overpass. On November 22nd, Mr. Dodd, what did you see, and what did you hear? Well, I seen the president 
roll over and they'd slump over in his seat, and then I saw Governor Conley slump over. And did you see anything which might indicate to you where the shots came from? Well, uh, we all three seen, four seen about the same thing as the shots, the smoke came from behind the hedge on the uh, north side of the plaza and a motorcycle policeman dropped his motorcycle in the street with his gun in his hand and run up the embankment to the hedge. Were you questioned by agents of any government agency on November 22nd, Mr. Dodd? Yes, we were. We were taken over to the courthouse and questioned by, I suppose, Secret Service men of some kind. And uh, they asked me quite a few questions, about the same as I've told you men here today. But you were never called as a witness by the Warren No, I never was called. But here's the Warren report, and in the index, your name is not listed. And there's no reference in the whole 888 pages to the fact that you were up there and you saw what you saw, you heard what you heard. Well, uh, I don't know about that. But uh, there was something that uh, looks to me like that uh, going on there that somebody should have found out something. A man woke up and shoot a man handcuffed to a couple of policemen and get away with it. Why? I figured there's something else that's going on besides what it should be. We are in Mesquite, Texas, in the home of James Leon Simmons, a car inspector for the Union Terminal Railroad. Were you a witness to the assassination of President Kennedy? Yes, I was standing on the Elm Street overpass at the time of the assassination. What did you see? And what did you hear? As the presidential limousine was rounding the curve on Elm Street, there was a loud explosion, and it sounded like it came from the left and in front of us, towards the wooden fence. And there was a puff of smoke that came underneath the trees on the embankment. Where was the puff of smoke, Mr. Simmons, in relation to the wooden fence? It was right directly in front of the wooden fence. Were you questioned by the Dallas police on that day? Yes, I was. Were you subsequently questioned by agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation? About a month later, I was questioned by the FBI. Were you ever called as a witness by the Warren Commission? No, sir, I wasn't. Do you think it's rather curious that you had such a fine view of the whole Dealey Plaza area, and you were among those who saw smoke coming from evidently behind the fence, and yet you were not called by the commission as a witness. Well, I always thought it peculiar, but I thought that's the way they did business. <laughs> On November the 22nd, James Tagg was standing in Dealey Plaza. He is unique among the witnesses, for he was struck by a ricochet. Mark Lane questions him. Right after the presidential car had turned the corner, I heard these three loud noises when I jumped behind the concrete abutment, which is between uh, Maine and Commerce. There was a motorcycle policeman that just stopped his uh, motorcycle up by the monument and uh, had drawn his revolver and was racing up the hill to the left of me. Uh, there was a deputy sheriff, which I think was stationed under the underpass, Buddy Walters, at this time. And I says, you know, I uh, felt something sting me on the face as I was standing down there. I said, just staying And Walters looked at me and says, yes, says, you got blood on your cheek. Uh, he says, where were you standing? And I says, well, down by the underpass. So we started walking down there. And when Walters got about, oh, I'd say 10 feet away, he says, look there on the curb, there was a very visible mark on the curb where a bullet had struck. Either a fragment of the bullet or a piece of the concrete it flew up and scratched my face. And at the time that you first heard the shots, 
What was your impression as to the origin of those shots? Uh, my first impression was that they had come from the left of me, up in this area here towards the hill. Where in relation to that wooden fence? Well, somewhere towards the wooden fence. Mr. Tag, on the 22nd, when the shots were being fired, your first impression was that they came from the area near the wooden fence. That's correct. Mark Lane questions Orville Nix, who took 8mm film of the assassination. Well, you now have a, a copy of your film, which you were kind enough to show to us this afternoon. Is that copy the same as the original which you gave to the FBI on December 1st? Uh, I would say no. There is some films maybe missing, some uh, frames. Uh, some of the frames were ruined. Does the film which you have at the present time have the same number of frames as the film which you delivered to the FBI on December 1st? Uh, I would say no, but it's cause of losing maybe a, a, a frame here and there. At the time the shots were fired, did you look at the book depository building? No. Uh, did you think at that time that the shots came from the book depository building? No, I thought it came from a fence uh, between the book depository and the railroad track. Uh, does anyone else who you know or who you've spoken with also believe that the shots came from there? Most everyone thought it came from the fence behind the book depository. Between the book depository and the... Between the book depository and the railroad track. At the present time, where do you believe the shots came from? Well, they came from the book depository because there's proof that it did come from there. I see. And this you've read in newspapers and you've read the report? Yes. I, I believe the warning, re warning report how do you now know that the book, the shots came from the book depository building? Well, they just have definite proof of it, all I know. Did you have occasion at that time and other occasions to speak with other witnesses in the area? Yes, I did. Did they tell you where they believed the shots came from? They all thought that shots came from the same place behind the fence. Did you have occasion to speak with Forrest Sorrells, who was, of course, a friend of yours, and the Secret Service agent in charge of Dallas that day? Yes, I did. Did he tell you where he thought the shots came from? He, he thought they were came, coming from the same place. Which is? Behind the fence. Mr. J.C. Price was on the roof of the Terminal Annex building at the moment the President was killed. Is this where you were sitting on November 22nd, Mr. Price? Yes, sir. Right here? Right here on this spot. And where did you think you heard the shots come from? From behind the overpass over there, a uh, triple overpass. Did you give that information to the Dallas Sheriff's Department on the very day of the assassination? Yes, I did. Now, I'd say in about 30 minutes after the assassination. Were you ever called as a witness by the Warren Commission? No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> Let me just ask you this one last question, Mr. Price. Do you think that it's rather curious that you were a witness to the assassination from a, a roof of a building overlooking Dealey Plaza, that you gave your statement to the Dallas Sheriff's Department the very day of the assassination, and yet the commission, which was investigating the circumstances of the crime, never bothered to call you as a witness to testify before them? I can't answer that, sir. Uh, uh, of course, I, I think I've seen as about as much of the assassination as anyone around this area. But as to why I wasn't called as a witness, uh, that's beyond me. But uh, it doesn't make me any difference. <laughs> Here is an interview with Billy Newman, made within minutes after the assassination. It was televised nationally but Mr. Newman was never called by the Warren Commission. May I have your name, please, sir? Bill Newman. Billy, tell me what you saw and what you felt. What happened to you? We were, we had just come from Love Field after seeing the president and the first lady, and we were just 
in front of the triple underpass on Elm Street, and the president's car was some 50 feet still yet in front, uh, of, you. In front of us coming towards us, and we heard the first shot, and the president, I don't know who was hit first, but the president jumped up in his seat. And then as the car got directly in front of us, well, a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the president in the side, side of the temple. Did, did you, do you think the first gunshot came uh, from behind you, too? I, I think it came from the same location. I, uh, apparently back up on the, the uh, uh, mall, I don't know, know what you call it. Do you think the shot came from up on top of the viaduct toward the president, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, not, no, not on the viaduct itself, but up on top of the hill, oh, a little mound of, oh. of ground near the garden. Testimony concerning the direction of the shots is concluded by Mark Lane and S.M. Holland. In effect, Mr. Holland, the Warren Commission published just a very small portion of your testimony and used your testimony as proof that no shots could have come from behind the fence. Did they accurately and fairly use your testimony? They are wrong because my testimony, and I made it very clear, that there was a fourth shot fired and one of those shots came from behind that picket fence. And there's no doubt in my mind, and never will be, because I was on the spot, I saw the smoke, heard the report, and saw the smoke from behind that fence. Mary Moorman took a Polaroid shot at the moment of the assassination. Here is an interview with Mary Moorman recorded November the 22nd, 1963. And I took the picture. It so happened my picture I, when I took it was at the same instant that the president was hit. And that does show in my picture. Did you realize what had happened when you heard oh, the shot? No, I didn't. Uh, there was, oh, three or four real close together. And it was, uh, must have been the first one that, that uh, shot him, because that's when I, that was the time I took the picture. And during that time, after I took the picture, and the, the shots were still being fired, I decided I'd better get on the ground. Did Mrs. Kennedy scream on the first shot? Uh, I don't know about the first shot, but she did scream. She says, my God, he's been hit, or he's been shot. Now, the picture you took, I understand the FBI has it now. Uh, yes, that's right. The federal police did have it on November 22nd, but it was never published or referred to by the commission. The agent who took it from Mrs. Mormon described it. Quote, Mrs. Mormon had taken a picture of the lead motorcycle officer. In the background of this picture was a picture of the book depository building and the window where the gunman sat when doing the shooting. A picture of the window at the time of the shooting? Why wasn't it published? Jack Ruby and the Dallas Police. We are in the office of Napoleon J. Daniels, a real estate broker in Dallas, Texas. Mr. Daniels, have you been associated with the Dallas Police Force? I was for seven years. Uh, in what capacity? As a patrolman. Where were you on November 24th, 1963? Uh, well, I was going down to inspect the assassination site uh, around 11 o'clock, I guess, and uh, I noticed Officer Vaughn standing in the, uh, on the Main Street ramp of the city hall at the basement, and uh, I stopped to go back to talk to him, and I asked him what his purpose was there. And he told me he was keeping anybody from entering the basement because they fixed to transfer Oswald. How long did you remain in front of the Main Street ramp with Officer Vaughn? Mm, about 20, 20 minutes, I guess. <clears throat> did you remain there until you heard a shot? I did. From 11 o'clock until 11.20, did anyone enter the basement through the Main Street ramp? There was one man about a couple of minutes before um, Oswald was shot. Could you describe that man? Yes, he was a white man, about weighed about 175, and uh, had on a blue suit, about 5'9". What was your impression when you saw him enter the basement with his hand in his pocket? My first impression was that he had a gun in his pocket, and then uh, I didn't think too much about it because Officer Vaughn didn't challenge him, he just let him go on down in there. 
Did Vaughn uh, indicate any uh, recognition or knowledge of who the person was when the man passed by him? Well, I just assumed he did because he didn't try to stop him. I assumed he knew who he was. Did Vaughn allow anyone else to enter the basement other than that one man? No. The Warren Commission said that Jack Ruby did enter the Main Street ramp, and they indicated that that happened between 11 o'clock and 11.20. If Ruby did enter the Main Street ramp between 11 and 11.20, was Jack Ruby the man who you saw enter? He'd almost have to be, because that's the only man I saw go down there. And now that you've seen pictures of Jack Ruby, does that strengthen your original impression that it was Jack Ruby who you saw enter or weaken it? I'd say you'd have to strengthen it. Mark Lane interviews Nancy Hamilton, a former employee of Jack Ruby. Mrs. Hamilton, did you testify as a witness before the Warren Commission? Yes, I did, on June 2nd, 1964. Would you tell us some of the uh, positions you've held over the years? I have been a freelance investigator for various police departments, district attorney's offices, such as the Sacramento District Attorney's Office, Suffolk County, Massachusetts District Attorney's Office, Boston Police Department, and various uh, private detectives. And before that, were you employed by Jack Ruby? Yes, I was. This was in 1961 in Dallas at his club, The Carousel, and I was bartender, waitress, and rather the manager there. How did you get that job? I had gone into Dallas not knowing anyone, and of course, the first place I went was the police department. And uh, they were very kind and got me the job there. They got you the job at Jack Ruby's? Yes, place? they did. Did they know Ruby? Personally, oh yes, very well. Vouched for him, wonderful person, great man. Well known by the Dallas Police Department. What were your duties there? Well, general bar duties, such as setting up the liquor, getting the bar ready for the evening trade. Uh, waiting tables if he was short-handed. Otherwise, I'd be behind the bar serving the drinks. Uh, did you ever serve drinks to Dallas police officers? Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, the Dallas police officers were the special boys, shall we say. We even had a private stock for them. Private stock? Oh, yes. They wouldn't... Uh, bar liquor wasn't for them. We had uh, names such as Hagen Haig or uh, Black Label. The very, very high-priced drinks on the house, of course, you'd never... And that was a gross uh, oversight if you ever charged a Dallas police officer or any official of the city of Dallas or Tarrant County. He said, don't offend them, cater to them, talk with them, even if you ignore the other customers. Bend over backwards to be nice to them. Did Ruby uh, perform any other favors for the Dallas police officers? Well, yeah, well, favors... Well, if we call them favors, uh, I suppose so. He provided girls, gambling, and booze. How many Dallas police officers would you estimate Jack Ruby knew on a personal basis? At least half and probably two-thirds. There were almost 1,200 police officers in Dallas in 1963. Would you say Ruby knew 600 of them? Oh, easily. Chief Curry of the Dallas police comments on Ruby's acquaintanceship with the Dallas police. A great deal has been written about the uh, relationship of the Dallas Police Department with Jack Ruby. Uh, we have 1,200 men in our department and we uh, had each man to submit a report regarding his knowledge or acquaintance with Jack Ruby. Less than 50 men even knew Jack Ruby and less than a dozen had ever been in his place of business. Most of these that had been in his place of business had been in there because they were sent there on investigations or had answered a call for uh, police service. Uh, I believe there was four men in our department that we were able to determine had been there socially, that is, off-duty in the presence uh, uh, and were present in his nightclub. You see, Jack Ruby was a man who wanted to be noticed, wanted to be known. And he used to frequent the Dallas Police Department. And he used to brag, uh, oh, I can get this fixed for you, or I can get that fixed for you. 
Did the Dallas Police Department or District Attorney's Office ever do any favors for Jack Ruby? Uh, several that I could probably name, such as uh, serving drinks a little late. You mean Ruby was permitted to serve drinks after hours? He did, and no one ever interfered. And of course it was common knowledge that he ran girls and gambling, and I've never seen him any kind of a uh, pickup on him. We are at the office of Penn Jones, Jr. in Midlothian, Texas, 25 miles from the Dallas courthouse. For the past two years, he alone in the Dallas area has conducted an independent investigation into the assassination of President Kennedy. Well, I love President Kennedy very much. I was one of the few weekly newspapers that covered the Ruby trial. And my actual investigating did not begin until I started reading the Warren Report and realized that something was very, very much amiss in reading that report. I really believe that the only way you can believe the Warren Report is to not read it. Have you found it difficult to uncover the facts this time? Yes, it's very difficult. Witnesses are reluctant. Some of them have uh, gone into hiding, or at least uh, cannot be found by me. In many cases, the police have actually told, or in some case, some witnesses say, federal authorities have told them not to talk about the assassination. There are at least eight persons now dead, either from murder or at least strange deaths, who were closely related to Jack Ruby, or Lee Harvey Oswald. Can you give us one, in one instance uh, of a witness uh, who died a strange death? Well, let's take the case of Betty Mooney McDonald, one of Jack Ruby's strippers. A fellow named Warren Reynolds saw a man running from the scene of the Tippett slaying. Shortly thereafter, Reynolds was shot through the head. Now, before Reynolds was shot, he could not identify the man running from the scene as Oswald. Then he was shot through the head, and a fellow named Garner was arrested. Then McDonald was the alibi for Garner. She said Garner could not have shot Reynolds because he was with me at the time. Two days after her alibi, Mooney, Betty Mooney McDonald was arrested for fighting with a roommate. Although the roommate was not arrested, McDonald was put in jail that night, and an hour later she was found hanged in her cell. And of course, the Dallas police said she hung herself. Did Reynolds finally testify before the commission? After Reynolds recovered from his wound, he testified and was able to identify Oswald. Mark Lane questions Mrs. Aquila Clemens about the killing of Officer Tippett. And did you hear the shots? Yes, I heard the shots. And what did you do? I ran out into the street and looked down the street and I ran back down the street where he was lying and I looked at him. Now, when you heard the shots and you went out of the house, did you see a man with a gun? Yes, I did. What was he doing? Oh, he was reloading it. When I said he was reloading his gun. And how would you describe that man? Well, he's kind of chunky. He's kind of heavy. He wasn't a very big man. Was he tall or short? Yeah, he's kind of short guy. Short and heavy? Yes. And was there any other man there? Yes, there was one on the side of the street. All I know, he told him to go. Mrs. Clemens, uh, the man who had the gun, uh, did he make any motion at all to the other man across the street? No more to him to go. Well, he waved his hand yes, and said, go on. Gone. And then what happened with the man with the gun? Uh, he unloaded and reloaded. And what did the other man do? The man kept going straight down the street. Now, did you testify before the Warren Commission about this case? I haven't said anything to anyone. Did anyone come to see you after the murder of Officer Tippett? Yes, he was a man who came. I don't know what he was. He came to my house and talked to me. 
But I don't know what he looked like a policeman to me. He did. Did he have a gun? Yes, he wore a gun. Mrs. Clemens, how long after Tippett was shot did this man with a gun come to visit you? About two, about two days. He was about two days. Said that I might get hurt. Uh, someone might hurt me if I would talk. About what you saw? What I saw. He just told me to be the best if I didn't say anything because I might get hurt. I would love to see a computer uh, faced with the problem of coming up with the probabilities in the, of the assassination taking place the way it did with all of these strange incidents that took place before and are continuing to take place after the assassination. I think all of us who love our, this country should be alerted that something is wrong in the land.